Hello, everyone. Sorry, I'm a few minutes late. I think that pretty much exemplifies my entire college career. So, uh, yeah, I'm very happy to be back again, uh, second year in a row, to kind of talk to the design thinking class. I mean, I think that the work that we do falls into a very interesting niche between uh, digital media and architecture. So it's really nice to be involved with the architecture school in general, because I think a lot of this stuff is is kind of at the forefront of where technology is going. How do you how do you combine the world around you with this great digital media, uh, augmented reality, uh, you know, other things like that. So I'll give you a little bit of background before I jump into, uh, you know, some stuff that we're working on and some projects. A uh, little background on me, I actually studied architecture for a few years uh, before I decided to quit college for a while and go travel around and uh, just, you know, be a 21 year old. Uh, but I did study architecture for a bit, both here at UNM and at a school back in Ohio. Uh, and I ended up switching to engineering when I came back to school and went into computer engineering of all, of all things, uh, but still kept close to the art and architecture world, did a lot of work in uh, electronic arts, so kind of combining technology and space and digital media. Uh, and so I ended up getting kind of a dual, uh, dual degree in computer engineering and art. And then just for fun, I got my MBA, which has helped me a lot in starting my own business since then. So a little bit of everything. I got a little bit of business, a little bit of art, a little bit of uh, architecture, technology. Uh, but it's been a very winding path. So if you're still searching for your path, don't worry. You, you know, I didn't figure mine out until well into my 30s. So uh, lots of ways to get to where you want to go. Uh, and then a little bit of background just professionally. Uh, I worked a lot in the service industry through all those years in school, which has kind of led to some projects that I'm working on now, which you'll see, which are fairly interesting. Uh, but I ended up working in the architecture field for a bit. I actually worked at Antoine Predoc's office. Uh, during the building of this building, so we actually got to climb around in some of the trusses, the trusses and structures up there uh, when it was uh, in, in mid-construction. Mid uh, and then I went, as I transitioned more into the technology, I worked at Sandia National Labs for a few years, building kind of data visualization uh, through code for some of their high-performance computer simulations. So we did a lot of fluid simulations and things that were very beautiful and had tons of, you know, kind of great deal of data, but essentially no one's ever going to see them. There are things that were done for uh, military applications, you know, I mean, the one that I was actually allowed to talk about was we were working on flame. What would happen if flame surrounded a nuclear weapon? And how would the nuclear weapon itself actually be impacted by fire around it? So we actually had to do these simulations of what happens when the fire goes around the bomb and is it safe? and you know, as you can imagine, it was very interesting, but also kind of very boring at the same time. Uh, and so that actually kind of, along with a lot of my kind of public facing art exhibitions, forced me into a decision where I wanted to do really interesting work, but do it in public view where people could use it and play with it and see it. Uh, and much more on the artistic side than on the scientific side. So that pushed me to look at a local company here uh, called IDM, which I worked at. Uh, briefly, so I was there for a few years and, and ran their creative uh, team for, for a number of years before branching out and starting my own business uh, end of 2016. Uh, we officially launched last March, so we're coming up on kind of our full one year anniversary. Uh, actually, I think it was last week, which is, which is a good milestone for a, for a, a startup. So that's where I am now, and, and I run a company called Story Lab, uh, and Story Lab is essentially kind of uh, bringing together of all the components of, of my education and my interest in that we want to build activations for physical space. You know, we're, we're software developers and media artists at our core, but we try to combine all of the things that we know and our knowledge to actually make activations in, in space that either isn't activated already or is a new structure that's being built where you're building in some new technology infrastructure. Uh, and we've done a lot of interesting things both in you know, we did a lot of work for the biopark and we've done some work in restaurants. We did some projections in malls, which I'll show you. So it's kind of a variety of spaces. You know, our clients can range from uh, public facing, you know, universities. We're working with Eastern New Mexico University on a project to, uh, you know, a brand. Like, you know, the mall wanted to put up something for retail engagement in their, in their space. So the clients can range from, you know, nonprofit to profit to brand oriented to state run. It's a really interesting dynamic that we don't really have a real small segment of the population. And in some of our dining activations, which I'll show you, you know, it, the consumer is our, our client. So 
it's it, it really that's one of the one, one things I like about the work is that it's varied. You know, you know, we're not working on the same thing day to day. Every project is a little bit different. It's a little more interesting, uh, and you get to play with a lot of different technology. So one of the key things that we're really focused on, in addition to activating the space, is making the space contextually uh, available to the user. So like, as an example, I'll talk about kind of our first, our first project that we did last March actually was with the Biopark. And if you've been to the zoo, this is in their reptile house. Uh, they have an old mural that they put in 1980 or 81, I believe. And they did a small renovation, not much, you know, some new, new paint, a couple activations and some other things. But they were discussing whether to just paint over this mural completely or to actually make it something that was kind of brought in the 21st century. Uh, and they had, you know, one half you got the, the people that are on the conservation side that said, hey, we got to keep it. It's, you know, it's been here for, you know, 30 years, 35 years. How do we make it still, you know, still relevant? And then you got people that are like, it's the ugliest thing I've ever seen and just paint over it. Uh, in the end, they couldn't come to a decision. So they're like, how can, we, how can we bring this to the 21st century? So what we proposed was a motion activated wall that as you walk by the, the mural, you've got all these different dinosaurs which are either improperly labeled or the pictures are out of date scientifically because now dinosaurs are, you know, have feathers and they didn't in 1981. Uh, you know, a brontosaurus is not brontosaurus anymore. It's a patosaurus. I mean, there's like things that are just wrong that are on the, the mural. So how do we correct those things visually but still keep the mural in its original state? So what we proposed was a motion activated installation where as someone walked in front of the mural, the the content would be triggered based on their location and would activate just the dinosaur or just the piece that was relevant to them while they're standing there. So as you can see, someone walks by, it triggers pieces. And then, you know, multiple people can stand in front of it at one time. And so in the end, what we have is a, uh, I don't know if I, hopefully I don't have sound here. Okay. Uh, yeah, actually, that'd be great. And actually, if you wouldn't mind just shooting a picture of a couple points throughout the lecture so I can throw that on our blog, that'd be awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll show a little video here. Uh, so we worked with the herpetology department, which is the reptile department, to figure out you know, what the best words were. Uh, and that's another point about dinosaurs, right? They're not, they're not, they're not reptiles. So. Yeah, that's good. You can just turn it off. Uh, you don't need to sound. So as you can see, as you walk in front of it, it triggers pieces based on where the user's standing, right? And so uh, you can have multiple people standing in front of each of the pieces. It outlines the dinosaur in question. It gives you one contextual piece of information. Really quick, one sentence says, dinosaurs are not reptiles. Dinosaurs may have had feathers. You know, something that someone might actually take away from the exhibit. Uh, and it was really powerful. This is another small piece that we did in that same space, a little more traditional. It's just a touch screen that allows you to, to answer some questions and, and swipe through content. Uh, in my opinion, a little less interesting, but that's something else they wanted. But the, the real power of the contextual piece is that it's relevant to you as you're standing there. It kind of is a little magic because you're not expecting it. It pops up on something that has a state of its own before the content shows up. So it, it really kind of brings something, you know, makes something old or something new out of something old, as well as gives new life to something that was scientifically inaccurate. You know, you kind of see the change over time. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> Always got to silence the cell phone. Right? It's you. It's you. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just turn that off so it doesn't rain again. So, so this was the first project that we did that was in. Uh, uh, March of last year, and it really kind of speaks to the core of what we want to do, which is activating space and giving, you know, meaning to things that are already are in place, but also have layers of information that might not be there. Uh, in some ways, I would say that this is a much more interesting augmented reality than having to use your phone or use goggles. I think that we're going to get there in terms of the technology, but being able to activate space where you don't have to hold anything, where you don't have to download an app, where you don't have to like go through these extra steps is really kind of key, I think, to holding people's attention. Uh, the other part that we do is not just permanent installations like that, but we also do a lot of site-specific and very ephemeral, very temporary exhibits that pop up, you know, for a day, for a month, for a week. 
uh, that activate space. And you're making use of characteristics of that space that are, that are unique. And you know, we've done a couple. This one is less about the space and more about the, uh, about the location and the timing. So we did an inter interactive yoga piece with Presbyterian and, and uh, DPS that was active during Balloon Fiesta. So if you parked in some of the ancillary lot lots up by the Presbyterian building and had to walk down, you could come and, and do some active yoga either in the morning or the evening or at any time you know, as you're going to some of these events. We found that people don't want to do anything active at 5 a.m. They just want to walk right by and hold their coffee and it's freezing. So if we did it next year, we'd do it in the evening. But the evening events were really well attended. People would stop and play and the weather was better. The temperature was warmer. Uh, and so we really got a lot of people to engage. You know? So as in this case, you're standing in front of the screen. It's tracking your, your motion. You're trying to match a, a particular yoga pose. Uh, Presbyterian's main goal was just to get people active, to talk about their wellness center, you know, just remind people of the buildings here. So. Uh, and we did some, some analysis on it too, you know. We got a ton of people through the, the installation and it's, it, I would say from a marketing piece, it was very successful. Uh, we're also continuing to work with Presbyterian for their grand opening in Santa Fe, their new, their new hospital. We're gonna do some really big activations uh, in September for that. So the, the relationship has, has blossomed since this too. Uh, so that's a site specific piece that is more about, more about the client and the timing with the balloon fiesta. And then you get something like this where Site-specific means really site-specific. And this was a little test that we did, which la later went on to be some, some trees that we did for the uh, River of Lights, where we activated the trees and mapped each of the branches with projection. So th these are tests that we did in our studio. These are just smaller trees. But it turned out, I, I love the little video, which is why I'm showing this one versus the final, just because it's so it's kind of com compelling. We essentially mapped every single branch independently and then wrote software that would send particles in different patterns along the tree branches. Uh, and it just has this, you know, trees just are so amazing in general, but, you know, to give them a little more life, uh, they really kind of come to life when you put a little bit of light on them. Uh, so here's another one just to show you uh, in daylight. You know, it's a little interesting to see it in daylight where you can actually see the tree and see the, the light on it. It almost makes it look like it's kind of glowing, like it's got this, like, really interesting, uh, you know, a little bit of, little bit of magic, if, uh, for lack of a better word. But when you see it, when it's dark, you know, you can tell it's a projection. When it's light, it's, it's sort of, you're like, what's going on here? Why, where's this little bit of light? And then this video I like to show just because I think it really tells about how you can make it look like you don't really understand where the light's coming from or how it's working. I mean, this was just a test, but this is two projectors just down in our studio. And we posted this video on YouTube and we had people like asking us like what we were feeding the trees, like was it like phosphorescent food or something, you know. And it's really just, it's a small algorithm, it's from two different directions so you get a little bit extra coverage. And it's really just mapping those branches so specifically that it seems like they're, the pulses are being carried up the branches. I mean it's just kind of a neat, really neat effect. Uh, so onto another space that has some interesting characteristics. This was a projection piece that we did over the holiday at a mall in Boston. Uh, they have two entrances like this where you come in on the first floor and you walk in and there's got this beautiful atrium as you can kind of see up at the top here. But you have to walk around this 50 foot escalator bottom to get into the space. So architecturally I'm not sure why, you know, they, why they put the escalators there. But it, it also gives us a really great canvas to put information on because it's just wide open and you have to see it. And you have to walk around it before you can get into the center of the space. So, we did both entrances with four uh, high brightness projectors at each end. And, you know, here's a little time lapse of kind of showing some of the content. The, some of the content was, was stock footage we purchased and some of it was animation that we created. Uh, it was up for uh, three months. It ended up starting with holiday content, as you can see on the right, that we animated. And then it gradually worked into something a little more uh, just kind of random pieces of stock footage that the client was interested in showing. Uh, it was a good test for us too because you don't see a lot of daylight projection because of the very reason of brightness. Now these are really bright projectors but you would not know that because of the fact that there's so much ambient light in the space. Uh, some pieces are more impactful than others. Uh, so for us it was a good test to see like what we could do in daytime projections. Uh, and, and you know for the client to see if they would get some engagement. They had a lot of people kind of stopping and taking pictures and looking up and they're, they're trying to see if they can engage their their visitors in new ways. And a lot of spaces, particularly malls, are trying to come away from the traditional kind of 
capitalism model of you just come into shop, but like how do you make these centers places for art and places for activity and you know, art activations like this are important to them uh, as they try to build more of a community around what they're doing. So, so it was a really cool thing for us to do. Uh, very challenging to manage a project across the country where it's got to run every day. There's these, you can't really tell in these pictures, but the projectors are on a shelf 14 feet above the floor that have no access except by scissor lift. So if anything happens to any of the projectors or computers, there's, you know, somebody's got to get on a scissor lift and get up and change it. So we had all kinds of remote configurations, like our own network access, like we brought all our own hotspots and built, it was crazy. But we could actually log in and watch this live from several different cameras at any point throughout the installation so that we could modify and change. And if, you know, something happened, we could restart everything. Uh, it was a very interesting, interesting project. Uh, here's just another shot from the second floor, kind of looking down at the size of this. So it's interesting from this shot because the gas comes over your head. So here's where it was the most impactful because you're closer to the projectors, so it's a little brighter. Uh, you know, I think it's an interesting, interesting place to put this kind of content in the mall. And I, you know, it would be nice to find more clients and more people in the retail world that see the value in some of this to try to engage people because I think it has some, you know, some lasting impact if you can get it right. So. But also being able to make use of these big architectural features that are, you know, in some ways eyesores. They're necessities, but they're also eyesores. So, uh, you know, and thankfully they didn't ask us to put adver uh, you know, ads up there. We were, that's what we the first thought they were going to have us do, and we were grateful they did not do that. Uh, and then on a little smaller scale in terms of augmenting pieces with projection, this is just a small test. We're working on a book that essentially what it does is... Uh, as it recognizes what pages are being projected are being shown, so you can imagine a kid in a library walking up to a kiosk and slowly flipping the pages, and as you flip them, the pages actually come to life in, a, in an animated fashion. So, uh, this is a test that we've been working on. This is a little book that, that was given to us by uh, Unite for Literacy, which is an organizational group that builds these little books for kind of nonprofit organizations like zoos, and you know, this is an energy group out of LA talking about how to. Uh, you know, how to save energy and when to turn things on and off. So this is a really good test as to what might be possible. So right now you just flip through the pages and as it actually recognizes the page that you want, and we did a couple different pages, then it will trigger a new animation. So, uh, which is pretty interesting because what can happen is that what you think is kind of static all of a sudden comes to life and brings like another layer of information that you couldn't see. You could imagine a story that has some great visuals already, and then the characters kind of pop out and walk around the page and point to something else, or if you tune it with audio, maybe there's a little another layer to the story, or maybe the author comes on and talks about his book or something. Uh, it's kind of ironic to add audio and video to a book for literacy, where you're kind of trying to get people to read more, and you're like, but hey, look at these great visuals. Uh, but at the same time, I think that it does have some power in talking about the, the power of books as a whole. So. Uh, and then I want to kind of branch into something that we're working on pretty heavily, and, and there'll be more about this in the coming year as we, as we work with some partners to get it built. But we're working on some large-scale active digital play spaces. So, you know, you think about jump parks and things of that nature where you're, you're coming in, you have a very specific physical activity, uh, you pay for an amount of time, you go in, you jump, you play, uh, and then you leave. And, while the jump parks are very successful, they're also kind of a one-trick pony. Like you can go in and play, and you know you're done after a period of time. Like, but what if those environments had more to them? You know, maybe if you could play with uh, play with balls, and the walls changed and did different things based on what your you know what time of day it is or what the activity is. You know, so we've been working particularly on a new wall-activated ball game that essentially. You could, any size ball, any number of players, you know, as you actually engage with the wall, the content changes, you can have teams. Uh, we're gonna be demoing this in the fall in a couple different schools. We're also gonna be hopefully having a permanent space that has some of these up for public use in the not too distant future. We're working on that. But in addition to the ball, there's all kinds of other ways. Like how do you make just digital worlds that change over time? So you could imagine going to a place, uh, you know, kind of a hybrid between a jump park and Meow Wolf where you've got this world that you can explore that's digital. But the real power is that you explore it for half an hour and then the whole thing changes wholesale. So then all of a sudden it's a new world and you could continue to build these worlds so that every time someone comes back to this space, it's different. It's like 
going to a museum and every time you go, the museum is completely different. Uh, I, and I think there's a lot of power in that. People kind of want that, you know, that visceral change. Like, you know, they want immediacy and, and new content, you know. And I think that while some of that I, I wish wasn't, weren't the case, it is, it is the, the modern audience, right? You want to have something that's really quick and really in your face. And yeah, I've already seen this. Give me something new. So how do you find a way to actually do that? Digital content can do it very quickly without having to rebuild an entire new space, you know. Uh, just another, you know, these are just kind of little tests we've been doing, but things that kind of fun, simple, simple things, but but pretty cool in terms of their visual power. Uh, this is actually a test we did for another project, which we're going uh, is going in right now at the aquarium that is going to have a river that you can interact with, uh, and that'll be opening sometime in the next two months for their their otter exhibit. But uh, this was kind of a test of being able to play with particles and control them with your shape. Uh, so essentially for the otter exhibit, we're doing this on the floor. So as you walk around, you're actually parting the water and it's moving around you. And you know, as you stop and, and move your legs, it'll kind of form puddles around your legs. So, uh, so you'll get a chance to play with this in its latest form, not, not, too, uh, not too far from now. Uh, and then just one more kind of simple test. Uh, you know, and this actually, this piece, this test actually, we showed it to a client and they liked it so much and it's really kind of simple that we actually implemented this at a, at a location in Washington, D.C. Uh, just, just two weeks ago. <laughs> but they really wanted just this wall. It actually came out to be red. But uh, here it's another test just of blocking and, and physics reactions to particles. So really simple, but kind of elegant. Uh, so then I'm going to move into what's been kind of our most successful, and by successful I mean most attention-grabbing piece. And, you know, I circle back to my years in the restaurant industry, and when I first started StoryLab, I had this idea of building kind of an interactive dinner experience where you could sit down and interact with the table, and the chef would be able to tell a story through the art on the table. And a lot of the stuff that I did in my, my time in the restaurant business, I worked for a lot of fine dining restaurants, and, you know, they would do specialized dinners, beer dinners, wine dinners, you know, dinners from around the world, Italian dinners. I mean, you have these themed events. But how could you add a little more power to the themed event and almost make your own dinner theater right at the table? So I proposed this to uh, Savoy, a local restaurant here in the Northeast Heights, who uh, I had worked for uh, many years ago. And you know, they looked at me and were like, what the hell are you talking about? Uh, but I was able to talk them into doing the first event. You know, so here's, a, here's kind of a recap of that first event with some visuals to kind of give you a sense of what it is. And then, then I'll show you our latest event, which has a little more visual impact. So what it is, is it's a fully projection map table with motion sensors over the entire duration, so you can move and interact with the content. Uh, it's four projectors. There's a big truss system above their heads that's kind of, it's not too, uh, too heavy. It's got a lightweight truss, but it, you know, is all wrapped in black, so it hides in the background a little bit. Uh, and we did five courses, a bunch of different animations, and then every course had some interactive content. Uh, I don't know if this video shows the interactive content as much as the next one, but it went over really well. It sold out uh, almost immediately. We just did our second dinner with Savoy a couple weeks ago, and we did four times as many people, and it sold out uh, in a couple weeks. So we've had good success with it, uh, so much success that we had a group in DC that builds called the Art Tech House, which does these large digital art installations, uh, reach out to us to do one of these events for their latest cherry blossom themed uh, installation. So we have one up there running for the duration of next month and in, into May. And I'll show you a little video of that one. Uh, this one's a little bit different because it has a different visual style. But it also has lots of uh, really interesting uh, interactive components, much more interactive. So they do a whole bunch of stuff uh, in addition to the table. So this is, you can see the table uh, parts. Some of, this, some of these things we helped out with, some we did not. but. It's all cherry blossom theme, so we did a bento box based dinner. Uh, there's the red wall that we put in for them as well. Uh, so you can imagine we went with, with flowers and traditional Japanese art styles and uh, butterflies and some very kind of, you know, different art that referenced kind of the theme and, and the rest of their exhibit. So these are all shots of the, of the dinner that you can see here. Uh, you know, so we had butterflies flying around the table. You could interact with various components, which you'll see in a moment here. So you, there's a water-based course. There's a kind of sand-based course where you can move. Uh, and it really adds like this other layer, you know. So we had an ink course. 
where you could play with the ink and on, on butterflies were, were kind of flapping their wings below the surface. Uh, let's see what other parts they show here that are pretty interesting. These are all animations that we created to, to go on the table. Let's see if they show another one of the interactive pieces. Uh, yeah, these are all these are all some of our canned animations: cherry blossom blooms. And so that's an interactive. You can see the fireflies are generated by their hands as they wave their hands around, uh, and. See, I'm hoping they show the sand piece, because the sand piece is pretty cool. Yeah, so there's the water. You can interact with the water with your hand. It causes ripples. Yeah, so, it, I mean, it, this, I think this was powerful enough for some people. Like, this is actually a video that a visitor made on their own. <laughs> <laughs> of their experience and posted. And we asked them if we could use it because we you were know, like, hey, this is great. Thanks for shooting this. Uh, so, and we found a lot of these videos online where people were like, well, let's check out this experience. So there's the sand. So as you move your hands around, you could push the sand. Uh, but it's a four course dinner. It really, you know, in, that, in this case, it was one big course. So the content changed as you ate. It was about a 45 minute experience. More on the experience. Uh, and that's the table during the day. So during the day, it's a much more passive state where you can come and play with it and paint. Uh, and then in the evening, you sit down and do the full dinner and get all these different courses and pieces of art. But uh, very well received. And you know, it's led, this in particular has led us to, we have conversations now with a resort group in, uh, in Spain, one in Mexico, and a big group out in California. So we're hoping to have more of these dining experiences pop up in the next year all over the place. Uh, some of them hopefully a little bit more immersive, where the table is just the start, but then we surround the walls. You know, you can really take you to Italy, take you to you know the desert if that's what you're talking about. I mean, it, I think there's ways where it becomes a real immersive experience. Uh, the table is just a start for us, but uh, it's got a lot of traction, so we've been sticking with it. So. The future for us, uh, looking very bright, we were actually just had a meeting with Presbyterian this morning where we're talking about this activation in Santa Fe. So, you know, put it on your calendars for September, come check it out. We're doing some pretty interesting digital engagements up there if you want to check out their new hospital. Uh, we're also working with Eastern New Mexico University. They have a new library uh, that is going uh, live for the new semester. So, my apologies. I don't know why this thing is making sound. Uh, and that is going to have a couple different in interesting interactive pieces, a kiosk, as well as some uh, interactive media elements on large walls around the primary lobby in that space. Uh, dining experience, as I mentioned, we have a bunch uh, coming up. And then the, the space, which I think is the most interesting, like how do you play in digital activated space uh, and then have the world change around you. Uh, and that will, be, that will be opening up pretty soon. So in general, though, I think that there's a lot of room for this type of work. You know, we're, we're filling a very small niche of activations and we're kind of making our mark in, in small ways, but there are lots of other firms, larger across the, the country that are building all kinds of really space-based activations. Uh, so much so that large architecture firms are actually incorporating these groups into their own structure. Uh, Gensler has been very uh, kind of forward thinking in, in this regard. They have a whole group doing uh, VR and, and place-based activations now so that they actually, while they're selling a big building, they're also selling this giant activated space as their lobby. And there's only going to be more and more of that as time goes on because people are kind of expecting these things. Uh, large corporate clients are expecting them to, to wow their clients and even consumers who are walking into a fancy building are expecting some kind of, you know, something, whether it's digital or not, they're expecting something to kind of like catch their eye and, and draw them in. More and more of that happens to be digital. Uh, and then the technology is just becoming so cheap and pervasive and powerful that these things are just going to become more and more, you know, ubiquitous. You're going to see them around you. You're going to interact with them. They're going to be extensions of the devices you carry. Uh, the projection equipment is getting brighter and cheaper, so you're going to see these things popping up all over the place. Uh, and then I think, the, you know, the augmented reality stuff is, while it's still device-based currently, you know, with, with Magic Leap coming on board here just recently with their first product, uh, I think it's very interesting to see what kind of augmented glasses that actually are glasses. Uh, you know, I don't know if you'd actually wear these, but the, uh, as they become lighter and, you know, these 
this is their best version so far. By some of them actually looked like giant metal boxes on their heads in some of their early photographs. But as these become more wearable, I would say that this is borderline even wearable. Uh, wearable maybe in your house. You're not going to wear this outside, right? But the idea of being able to walk around a space and activate it personally is pretty interesting. Uh, I think as long as the technology becomes lighter and becomes less of a barrier, you know, right now. The phone is kind of a barrier. You've got to pick it up. It's an isolating experience. You've got to look into the screen, and you, it's hard to share with the person next to you, where some of the stuff that we're doing is on a physical canvas where everybody kind of sees it at the same time, and I think there's a lot of power in that. So when the technology becomes light enough on your face that you can see something and someone else can see the same thing through the same glasses and it becomes social again and instantaneous, then you've got a lot of really incredible potential for, for these activations with these devices. Uh, I think we're still... Minim, minimal five years away from having something that is a, close to that, but you know we'll see. You can't actually buy this yet, but sometime very soon you'll be able to buy it. They released their their SDK, so you can actually start developing for it. You just can't actually use it. <laughs> so that's all I've got in terms of general content. Uh, I'd be happy to talk about technology. You know my background, any of the projects. If you guys want to see them again or have any questions. Uh, I think that you know, as it relates in terms of design thinking, you know, really design in physical space is a really interesting question, not just of the physical space in terms of architecture, but digital design in physical space. You know, how do you activate and give people information that's, that's useful? And we're slowly getting away from the kiosk model of, hey, we're going to put a screen in a space, and it's going you know, to be your wayfinding. Instead, now you can activate the entire space and find ways to really get people to not have to stop and look down at a screen. They can look up and look around. And, become more activated. So I think this is going to become a more prevalent topic in terms of design is how do you, you know, how do you build user experience for physical space? Uh, so thanks for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. You guys have any questions for him? Yeah, regarding the, the glasses that you just showed, what exactly does it do? Is it like a, like a VR type of thing or is it like a hand gesture recognition so that you can uh, interact with something in front of you? Or so, so if anyone's been following Magic Leap, they're kind of a, a, a unicorn of all unicorns in terms of both startups but also technology. They, they've gotten $2.3 billion with a B in funding, and they haven't made a single pro project yet. Uh, I mean, they've worked with a bunch of different people. They're, they're working with Lucasfilm. They're working with Weta Digital and a bunch of studios to create great content. So I think when they finally do get to consumers, it's going to be pretty incredible. And you can't raise that much money without having something up your sleeve, right? So the idea is that unlike you know, the headsets that you've seen so far, these are truly a pair of glasses that you put on. You see through. You see the world through your own eyes. But there's a layer that's allowing things to pop up on that view contextually. So if I were looking forward and I'm seeing the chair, I would see you know, a little robot going around the chairs but going behind the chairs and jump in between aisles and it would seem as if that thing was in space because it's mapping the depth, it's mapping, it's taking cues from the image that I'm seeing because of all the cameras and doing actual occlusion, right? So there's a demo they did early on, if you can look it up, it's with, with uh, ILM XLab which is the kind of VR branch of Lucasfilm who's doing these crazy immersive Star Wars experiences. They did this test where someone's wearing the goggles and you see R2-D2 and C-3PO walk into the room and they walk around the furniture and they go behind the furniture and stuff projects on the table in front of you. So it's, it's mapping the world live so it knows where those things are so that you can put digital content in a relatable location, you know? So you're not, so you're not really, there's not a digital object there, but you're seeing only that portion of the object that's hidden above, that's shown above the table. The other part they're occluding because they're building a 3D model in real time that allows for that object to make it look like it's in real space. So you could imagine being able to walk around and see things sitting on chairs and actually look like they're sitting on chairs. And, you know, it's a, it, it, the potential is fantastic. You know, we'll just see what it is that they're, what the final thing is. So my guess is, and I don't know because they've been pretty secretive, is that a couple of these are standard cameras, probably HD cameras, and then the rest are depth-based cameras or structured light infrared cameras. So you're getting all kinds of different views of the world around you. Uh, but that's the goal. The goal is that you'd be able to like see a robot walking around in your room and actually interacting with your room like it was really there, you know. And I think there, if you ever go to their website, which is you know kind of over the top in terms of 
what they're hoping to be able to do is that you have a bunch of people looking at something through the glasses and be able to like watch a giant robot walk down the street all at the same time, right? Where you're not just in you know micro scale, but on a macro scale. How do you make these like really, really cool large scale augmented experiences? And then the augmented part I think is much more powerful than the VR part. The, the VR kind of takes you out of the world. The augmented puts you at least back in the world. Uh, as much as this would put you back in the world. I, mean, I don't think anybody would talk to you if you were wearing these, but... Uh. So in our projects, we've used uh, primarily Microsoft Connect version 1 and version 2. Uh, as that's reached its end of life, there's a couple other manufacturers out there that are making interesting cameras for depth sensing. There's a... Uh, there's a company called Zed that has a stereoscopic camera. So if you want to do depth mapping in real time in full light, which is pretty interesting. Uh, we haven't had a chance to mess with that one too much. But, and then there's a company that's been around for a while that we're using just a standard depth camera that they make, which is called Orbeck, and they make a couple different cameras. They're all somewhere around $200. But for us, the Kinect has been the most consistent, primarily just because they've had such a backbone of support. So we've been using that. but. Very, very soon we will not have access to it. In fact, as soon as they announced they weren't making the adapter for it anymore and they weren't making the Kinect anymore, the adapters were like $350 a piece on eBay. So it was like there was a mad run, probably from people in industries like mine who were like, we need to get those. So there's going to be something else that comes along, though, that replaces it. Yeah, so the dining experience is two connects, both pointing at the tables from different ends. So we're capturing kind of a double layer of, of data. It also helps with the occlusion so that, you know, if, if, I, if something is blocking the view of my hand here, that the other depth camera is getting it. So you can pretty much always interact with the table at all times. Uh, for, that's the same for the ball game and some of the other ones. The dinosaur wall that we did had three, three version one connects. So we're, depending on the size, there's multiples. Uh, and we're building it in such a way that we can just continue to add connects uh, right into the system. They're all kind of standalone units with their own processing, and we have computers that run them. So, you know, we could theoretically map any one big giant space with one computer and just a dozen little connect, uh, you know, pods, if you will. Uh, one connect has pretty good resolution. It kind of depends on what, what it is you're trying to do. So. Yeah, I was just wondering about how large the projectors were that you were using, like, say, the tree. Uh, so the little tree was, those were just small, kind of off-the-shelf consumer models. Those were 3,000 lumen uh, projectors, HD, 1920 by 1080. Uh, the ones that we used out in the field were 1920 by 1080, but they were 6,000 lumen Epsons. They're a little bit brighter, uh, so they stood out a bit more. And then we used four 12,000 lumen projectors for that elevator in Boston. So. Uh, but even with the 12,000 lumen projectors, they were, they were not bright enough. We needed like 40,000 lumen projectors, which are ridiculously expensive to rent for three months. So, uh, But it, depend, you know, it depends really more, less on the projector in some ways and more on the space. If you've got a really low brightness projector, but the room is perfectly dark, you're gonna, still going to get a great image. Uh, so, and then it depends on how far away you are. You know? So if you're, if you're 100 feet away, you need a really bright projector because you're going to lose a lot of that light between the wall or whatever you're projecting on and the projector location. There's a pretty exponential drop off in brightness, so. How close Yeah, it kind of depends. I mean, that's probably the biggest problem that we, ha we find is that every installation is so unique that you've got to find a projector that has a different lens. So we have, we have a fleet of projectors that are 8,000 lumen and when you swap out the lenses, they, we can get them as close as eight feet to get a really nice wall image, or we can get them as far away as 100 feet and get the same image. But you do that by swapping out the lenses depending on the distance. So lenses are expensive. You know, you can spend two to five thousand dollars just on a lens. Uh, and then some of the off the you know off the shelf models, there's some really uh, great what they call ultra short throw projectors where you can mount them 18 inches from the wall. But they have, but you really need a flat surface for those because they're using such crazy optics in those lenses that they distort it. So we tried to do a really ultra short throw, like right above like a non-standard piece, like something that had faceted structure. And the blur and the, you know, what they're doing with that lens just made it unusable. So 
if the, if the wall was flat, they're great. But if it's not flat, you have problems because you get all these weird blurring at the edges and, you know. It's, there are solutions for almost any location, but it really depends on what you need. Uh, there's just so many different options out there. Anyone else? Um, just out of my curiosity, what kind of um, programs do you use to actually do all this projection mapping and animation? Uh, so we use a variety of different programs. Uh, you know, most of the stuff we do, we write ourselves. So the all of the tree mapping and the Ellis escalator uh, and the dining are all, all done in JavaScript and HTML uh, using WebGL. So we're essentially using those languages and we're writing all of our own libraries to map. Uh, for some of the other installations, we've used Unity. Uh, un oh, we used Open Frameworks to do the dinosaur wall, so that was C++. So we kind of, depends, depends on who's writing it. You know, we have developers that are proficient in certain things and not others. So, like the dinosaur wall I did, uh, I wrote all the code for, code for that one because it was early on and I was pretty much my only employee. So I knew C++, so I wrote it in that. So really, it's, we'd like it to be both a combination of skill of the developer and need of the site, you know. Some sites just call for very specific things that some pro programming languages do better. If you're doing 3D, you might want to use something like Unity or Unreal to build it. If you're doing 2D, you might stick with Open Frameworks or, you know, we have a very skilled set of JavaScript developers, so we do a lot of project projects that way. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm not really sure. I'm not sure how it works yet. I think I've heard that they're either projecting light into your eyes, like on top of you know what you're already seeing, which I'm not quite sure of, or you're looking through a like semi-transparent LED array, which they have, and you're seeing that content kind of shown. Yeah, yeah, something. I'm not. I'm not quite sure what it is. <laughs> oh yeah. So this. So I, I don't know what that is, but I'm guessing that is. Uh, that's some kind of processing unit, but what you're not seeing is that there's actually a cable that connects down to what, they're, what they have calling the disk or something, the hub, and it's about this big, and it clips on your belt, and it has like a bunch of graphics processors, and you know, it's kind of like a super high-powered smartphone, from what I understand, so it, there is another unit that is powering that. Uh, but we'll, we'll see when it comes out. It was supposed to come out first quarter, and now it just says 2018, so. <laughs> Well, I think HoloLens pushed, pushed out their next version until next year because they didn't have any competitors. Uh, so we'll see what happens next year with what Microsoft does. Uh, and has anyone had a chance to use the HoloLens? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's pretty cool for what it is because everything's self-contained, you know, so you can walk around and it's mapping the world live and its field of view is really unfortunate because it's, you see this little tiny box of like content that, you know, you'd like to be able to see like this full field of view which is the hope for these, is that you're actually able to see what you want to see and look anywhere and not have clipping. Uh, but I, there were some really impressive things I saw about the HoloLens. Uh, but the other problem is that because it's this, this completely untethered experience, like you can't put a really big graphics processor in, in the headset of the HoloLens, so there were limits to how high a resolution image you would be able to see there too. So you got a lot of kind of really mediocre looking graphics that were nicely placed in the world, but you could tell they were mediocre looking graphics, right? So for a first gen augmented reality headset, they did a really nice job. Uh, so I'm really excited to see what happens the next gen of these things, because as things look better, as they're not as bulky, as the field of view is better, they're just going to get nicer and nicer. Yeah, I think actually, maybe not AR as much, but VR for sure has taken off in the building world. I mean, it's one of the few 
industries that's been able to grab the technology outside of gaming, of course, but yeah, the architecture world is the second largest VR market currently because you can transport clients, you know, right into a space that doesn't exist. You can, you know, view things at scale. You can, I mean, you can do all kinds of really awesome things in VR and AR that you weren't able to do before. So that's a yeah. No more questions. Um, thank you. Actually, we have one more. Okay. Oh, I did too. Has this been used in like a big nightclub or an augmented space? Uh, crowd would interact. Uh, when you say this, do you mean uh, technology like this or something yeah, more like the, like, like, th like this kind of stuff? Uh, the so crowds are interesting, right? Because you know here it's. There's, there's a crowd of people, but there's a very defined area for each person to interact, you know? So, like, you've got just the area around you. Uh, when you get large crowds, taking motion from a crowd is very difficult as to make it meaningful. You know, that's another thing that I really like about contextual experiences is that when they're contextual and you walk up to them and they react to you, there's a, there's a connection there, you know, that gives it meaning for you. When you're in a crowd and something happens, it's sort of like, did I cause that to happen? Or did he cause it to happen? Or is it random, you know? So getting it to work in crowds, I think, is a, is a unique challenge. We'd love to be able to find a solution for it. But right now, the only kind of successful crowd activations were ones where people have like RFID bracelets and things where you actually have some control. At, or th there's a program that's like lighting up your bracelet a certain color. And the more you move it, something happens as a crowd, where it's like, all right, shake the bracelet around. And there's motion sensors. and things change on more of a large scale as opposed to like picking a person out of a crowd. But, you know, considering the space we're trying to make where you can have lots of people in the same space, like tracking one person and giving that one person a different experience than the person next to them is, is something we'd like to solve, but it's, you know, it's in the works. So, but in terms of just shows, I mean, people have been using projection mapping in shows for years and years. In fact, that's a, where a lot of the really big activations have come in the last 20 years in terms of the technology. It's only now in the last five, 10 years becoming something that mainstream you know, corporations are using. It's been in the show world for a really long time. You know, Bands have been using it. Theater productions have been using it. Uh, it's just that it's becoming more approachable from a cost perspective. So yeah, if you, go to, if you go to shows, DJs have been using it forever. <laughs> a lot of the projection mapping software that's come about has become about because DJs wanted to do light shows you know, with their sets. So a lot of this comes out of that stage world. Uh, and ironically, you, ha you have this like, uh, thing in movies and, and science fiction where the user interfaces and the interactions precede the actual technology. And now they're actually starting to come to fruition. It's almost as if like we're basing our future tech on what we see in the sci-fi movies, and not the other way around, <laughs> which is which is fairly interesting, right? So there's a great book out there about a, a designer who just essentially takes modern user interfaces and then r r goes back to movie sci-fi movies out of the 60s, 70s, 80s, picks out pieces and shows how these things have like come to actual fruition. Uh, I'll I'll send that to Tim just so you can have that link, but it's a fantastic book. So. Yeah, big public activations are, are, are awesome. You know, projection's tough because you lose it 60% of the day, right? Because it's the daytime brightness of, you can't battle the sun, right? I mean, the sun is like 10,000 lumens per square foot or something, you know? So being able to like match that kind of brightness is difficult. You can do it with LED arrays though, where the arrays themselves actually give off enough light where you can see them during the day. but. I mean, that would be the hope, particularly for me and for other businesses like me, is that you get more public support for these kinds of things. So that when new buildings and new spaces are built, they're like, hey, we need some kind of art, light activation that really makes the location a beacon, you know? Uh, we've been talking a bit with the city and a couple of businesses downtown about making like a new digital watchtower 
for the city that would be you know projected on buildings but also led structures so that like you could drive downtown and see this thing kind of glowing and giving you the time of the day and uh, just something that would you know make it very noticeable but really add a nice artistic centerpiece to the city so we hope we hope we'll get more public support but you know gov government's always struggling in one way or another right they're laying people off they have budget issues in some areas like c can getting somebody to pay for a hundred thousand dollar art installation is like you know that's a tough that's a tough decision <laughs> Long term, I think there's value there, but when you're laying people off in this area, it's hard to convince municipalities that that's a worthwhile investment, right? So, but more people like us, like long-term value versus short-term gain, you know, I think it's I think it's worthwhile. Did you have another? Uh, do you think you'd be, do, be able to do it on the scale of maybe, say, like a small <coughs> indoor skate park? You know, like have an interactive. Uh, Something interactive with everybody going down the ramp, something like that? Yeah. I mean that that could be pretty that would be pretty incredible. We actually strangely enough at those tables in DC, like during the day they're just straight white and you do this like painting on them, but they're low to the ground like like you know, some traditional Japanese dining tables, like they're like eighteen inches off the ground, so you actually have to sit on a little mat to eat your bento box. But because they're so low and they're just white, everyone thought it was like a catwalk. So we were we and the docents were telling people not to walk on the table just because we didn't want them to break or fall, but it would be really cool to have somebody just walk down the table and like see that trail of like ink and paint follow them. So it'd be really awesome to do that. You know, you've seen stuff like that in After Effects after the fact, right? You like add trails to somebody move in. But if you could do it live in a real skate park and map the whole thing, yeah, it's completely possible. It would take a lot of setup and, and some re you have to do it like pitch black outside. But uh, yeah, that'd, that'd be cool. Uh, let's thank John. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah, thank you.